I had the privilege of working with Mark for many years. He was worked for Chuck Hagel up on the hill. He was uh, policy director over at uh, Heritage, uh, you know, at, at time at the Chamber of Commerce. So we just had lots of opportunity to be together, and I was always uh, just so deeply impressed by his patriotism. It started young. He was, um, you know, we've had some bona fide military secretaries of state, but Mark got his uh, the old-fashioned way. He was a West Point grad, okay, and uh, became part of the Screaming Eagles and served in combat. Uh, he knows at every level of command the challenges facing the department, and he had a lot of them when he was the secretary. We're going to dig into that this afternoon and uh, very much look forward to this conversation. Uh, Dr. Seth Jones is going to lead it for us, and so let me just, without further ado, I do want to ask you to, with your very warm applause, welcome the secretary and thank him for coming today. Thank, thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Hamry, and it is nice to be doing this in person. We have a packed audience here. Um, thank you for your service, and uh, it's great to have you. Thanks for a great book. As someone who has written books myself not quite this long, uh, I wanted to actually start off by getting, getting your sense about your goals and objectives in writing the book. Maybe it was cathartic, uh, but what, what, when you decided and made the decision to write it, based on your experience, um, Secretary of the Army, mm -hmm. Secretary of Defense, and then obviously we have various parts of your life uh, even before that, what, 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 what was your motivation and, and did anything surprise you as you looked back on your own life during a pretty tumultuous period? Sure, no, it's a great question. First of all, John, thank you for that kind invitation. So it's great to be here and great to be back at CSIS and to share this with you. So, you know, I, I didn't go into office thinking I'd write a book. I, I really didn't think about it until the end, uh, until um, I was uh, fired in November of 2020. And uh, I wrestled with, you know, what to do. Should I, should I not, and if so, when? And then I, as I reflected and talked to a couple people, it dawned on me, look, this, is, this period was too important. And this was before January 6th, by the way. I thought that this was too important of a period of time in our nation's history, too tumultuous for me to not write about it, because I thought it would be very important for the American people to know their history, to know what happened. Um, and so my first motivation was that, to op open it up, uh, open this uh, period of time, the last two years of the Trump administration, and explain what happened, give it from the perch of not just a cabinet secretary, but a cabinet secretary responsible for the Department of Defense, um, which was often President Trump's go-to department, and I can, I can expand on that if you, if you like. Uh, but then it became more about the, the secondary audiences, right? The people at the Pentagon who I'd served with or served for me, folks who wanted to understand what it's like to work at that level, what a Secretary of Defense thinks about. I wanted to write it for students of government, for people who are thinking about going into government to explain how that works as well. So I had multiple audiences in mind as I wrote that. And, and as I did write it, I was very careful to not just give the play-by-play, -play, but to give the play-by-play -play and then provide color commentary, right, as to what was going on in my head, and then try to put it in a broader strategic environment. So I, I try to write it from three different levels. And you'll see in some of the chapters, whether it's a chapter about uh, Russia or China, I try to be prospective to talk about things I think the country should do or we should consider from a policy perspective. So I try to round it out in a lot of different ways. And, um, and so that was that piece. I mean, you asked about the most surprising stuff. Um, I think when I was said and done writing it, and I wrote it fairly quickly, about four or five months, um, throughout the process I would send it out to people who were involved in the different parts. And at the end of the day, I think I counted up nearly three dozen four stars, senior civilians, cabinet members, stuff like that, that I sent it out to to kind of cross-check. I, I said I wanted to be objective and fair and complete as much as possible. And on a few occasions, people would come back and say, you know, you, that wasn't exactly right. This is what was going on behind the scenes that we couldn't tell you or that you didn't see or that wasn't, you know, we wouldn't raise with you anyways. And I thought, wow, that's, that's interesting. And if I kind of had knew that, I might have done something a little bit differently. But you get people coming out and telling you some of the background stories that they couldn't tell you at the time. And I, that was fascinating for me to learn that aspect of it. No, that's interesting. Uh, well, uh, it's a great read, um, and you hit on a lot of topics that are quite relevant today. One of them that I wanted to start off with is uh, the Russians. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they were a concern as you were 
Secretary of the Army. They were concerned as you were Secretary of Defense. February 2022, uh, they invade Ukraine. So from your perspective, just curious, one of the things that's interesting is when you look at how the U.S. IC was looking at the Russians uh, before the war, there was a general sense that their capabilities were mm -hmm. strong uh, and that their doctrine was, some would argue, reasonably sound. What a lot of people got wrong in the end was when it came to the Russian ability to fight. Uh, morale, command and control, uh, combined arms, they mm -hmm. struggled against the Ukrainians. So can you talk a little bit about how you looked at the, at the Russians um, and then how things transpired after the invasion? Sure. Well, first of all, a little context. I made it my top priority coming into office, uh, as I said during my confirmation hearings, my first messages to the, to the force, that my top priority be, would be implementing the NDS, which said that China, then Russia, were our top two strategic priorities. And everything I was going to do was going to focus on driving that agenda forward, right? And so at the time, um, and probably up until 13 months ago, because we're, we're on the 11-month anniversary of Russia's invasion, the debate within DOD would be, well, is, is Russia a peer or a near peer, right? That was, which should we call them? Look, to me right now, they're a second-rate conventional military power with nuclear weapons, maybe a third-rate military power with nuclear weapons. So I think we got it wrong in terms of our assessments of the Chinese, I mean, I'm sorry, the Russian ability to conduct combat operations. Uh, they failed, uh, their, their equipment's failing, their generals, generalship is weak, their soldiering, their lack of NCOs. Uh, their ability to maneuver on the battlefield. I mean, you go kind of all the functions of war, and they just are falling short. And so it, it's, it's a lesson learned for us. So one, there are a couple of questions that are, that are follow-on. One is, um, what's your lesson as you take for the Pacific? I mean, we've, we, when, when you look at the PLA, it hasn't fought a war since the 1970s. Significant capabilities, which you tracked while you were secretary. How do you assess uh, an adversary like that when you're trying to get into the qualitative aspects of this? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question, and I'd rather overestimate the threat than underestimate the threat. And another difference here is, at least with the Russians, we saw what they did in Georgia in 08, we saw what they did in, in Ukraine in 2014, we saw them, observe them in Syria, where they're conducting operations. We could, we could see parts of them, but we haven't seen that with the Chinese. They haven't fought a war since the you know, 1979 invasion of, uh, of Vietnam, and that lasted a few years, so I, I don't think we know. Now, I think the other people taking lessons, I've said this in other contexts, is that Xi Jinping should be uh, waking up every morning and asking his generals, are you guys really as good as you tell me you were? Because Putin's generals told him he could take Kiev in 36 hours, and they couldn't do that. And then I think the other big lesson, of course, is, uh, and, and our friends in Taiwan are taking it to heart, is the, is the demonstration by Ukraine, their, their, their courage, their skill, their commitment to defending their country, and what a, a country that's, a, what, a tenth the size of Russia, a tenth the economy, everything. Uh, everybody would have said they would immediately lose, and they've, they've shown what resilience and, and, and courage can do under battle. And I think it's a great lesson for Taiwan, and I think they're taking it to heart. And, uh, and it's, in that scenario, I think they could, Taiwan rearming itself, adopting the porcupine strategy, restoring one year's conscription, all those things will help deter a conflict uh, with China, which is a good thing. So on the deterrence issue, which you just mentioned, how would you argue that the, the war begins, the, the U.S. and the current administration raise the prospect, particularly of economic sanctions? Uh, U.S. also makes it pretty clear that, uh, that Russia should not step onto any inch of NATO territory. To what degree could we have, should we have thought about a more robust deterrence for an invasion of Ukraine? Yeah, I was uh, critical of the Biden administration early on. I think there were some misstatements. You know, remember the difference between a minor incursion and a major incursion, and then uh, the president took the use of uh, military force off the table. I don't think you should ever take the military option off the table because I said at the time, we don't know how ugly this war is going to get, how bad the Russians will be, and, and they haven't let us down, right? And so I thought those were mistakes, but we, we quickly picked up ground. I think the administration, the president's done a good job in terms of unifying the allies uh, from a, not just a military approach, but economic, diplomatic, financial, et cetera. And to me, that was very important because that, I think, is what Beijing was looking at, is would the West stand up to Russia and would they push back to defend this young democracy because of the parallels, right? 
And uh, because my rationale is if you're in Beijing and if Europe won't defend a, a small democracy against an autocracy in their front yard, did Beijing really think they were going to defend Taiwan half a world away? And the answer is no. And so I was really glad with how NATO came together and not just NATO. I mean, you got to broaden that out. Non-NATO countries, Japan, Korea, Australia, others who have stood behind, um, who have stood behind um, uh, Ukraine. And it's, it's been wonderful. There have been disappointments, India, for example, but uh, I, I think it's been, it's been great and that was the right thing. And I, now look, I think we've been behind the curve along the way with regard to providing weapons and arms and whatnot. And we could talk about that, but for the most part, we're doing the right things. Yeah, let's talk about that, actually, because obviously a subject of debate earlier in the week, it didn't look like the Germans are going to provide leopards. Uh, now the U.S. has stepped forward with Abrams. So every step of the way so far, we've had this incremental um, increase in the types of systems that we've been willing to provide. What's your general sense? I mean, it's a, it's a calibration to some degree. Um, or, or at least that's, that's the way some will argue, that there's a, there's a fine-tuned calibration, and you're worrying about escalation. How, how do you view supporting the Ukrainians? How worried are you about providing weapon systems that might lead to escalation? I, I'm not. I, I don't think, uh, I think that's a false assumption. I think we can't let the Russians get in our head and saber rattle and then us be self-deterred because I think along the way we've been behind the curve. Look, we didn't start providing them really with robust, robust air defenses, and we still haven't, frankly, until after they were destroying Ukrainian cities, right, with Shahids and with uh, Iskander missiles and you name it. And so we were behind, and we're behind on tanks. It's great that the Germans now are agreeing to provide leopards. Why? Because we're concerned about a Russian offensive in the spring, which is March, which is five weeks away. So, I mean, do the math. If you're a logistician, it's going to take weeks to deliver the tanks. You have to train crews. That takes weeks. You have to train not just in individual skills, but collective skills. You've got to build up the logistics, the resupply systems, all those things. Look, I'm concerned we're not going to be ready in time. And rather than responding to a Russian offensive, I'd rather see the Ukrainians take the offensive now while the Russians are still trying to, you know, uh, train, equip, and organize their conscripts and beat them to the punch and really push them out of Ukrainian territory. But that's because we're behind the ball. We should have had those tanks to the uh, Ukrainians in September, October, if you will. Uh other types of systems the Ukrainians have been asking attack for. Us. We should have sent them attack them because that way the Ukrainians could reach deep into eastern Ukraine, deep into Crimea. Why? Knock out Shahid launch sites, knock out missile launch sites, uh, knock out logistics depots, barracks, you name it. You've got to have that long-range precision fires. You know, it's, we talk about my book, and I talk about how we, you know, drove a renaissance in the Army by uh, picking six areas at which we thought would be instrumental, key to future success in warfare. What's number one? Long-range precision fires. And so that's what the Ukrainians need. And we still haven't provided them the means to do that. So, you know, the Russians have sanctuary in Ukraine's own country to launch missiles that are destroying Ukrainian civilian infrastructure and killing civ uh, civilians. It's, it's tragic. Aircraft? Sure. We should have approved the MiGs. Absolutely. And that's, we still haven't heard that come back up. But that would have given them advantage. And now, look, if they're going to go into a combined arms fight, uh, you want to have not only... Uh, indirect fires, but uh, uh, fires from aircraft. And so will they be able to pull that off? I don't know. I want to get to a couple of issues uh, that you mentioned earlier on, including civil relations. But I do want to uh, talk about, since you brought up the Chinese, uh, to what degree, and you, you, you talk about this in the book, to what degree, as, as you were secretary, to what degree, how did you assess Chinese capabilities, where they were headed, how big of a threat that they were and what you needed to respond to that. Yeah, so I've been, you know, I've been working on the Chinese case, if you will, for 25, 30 years. My last job on active duty was a war planner for the Army, responsible for the indo pacom region. And so it takes off from there, uh, my study of the Chinese. And look, they've had a strategic plan since, at least since, you know, their entry into WTO in 01, uh, that they were gonna build out their military. They used their economy, as everybody does, to put uh, near double digit, at least high single digit, amounts of GDP into their military. They now have the largest army, the largest navy, they have a space capability, they have a really good cyber capability, and, uh, and they have probably have the largest uh, missile um, inventory in the Pacific, right? If not, maybe the world, I don't know. And so they've really built a capable military. Uh, now, do, do, they have, do they have the quality of training? Do they have a robust NCO core? All those things, we don't know. But if you were gonna count hardware, 
uh, they've really surpassed us in, in, in many ways in terms of the counts, right, the eaches. Uh, and so they're very strategic. They have a game plan. They say they want to be modernized um, by 27. Uh, they want to have a full force by 49, 2049. And then they want to dominate certainly the Pacific, if not the global order. And that's a threat to us, right? And if you want to live in a world of, dominated by the Chinese Communist Party where um, liberties and freedom and, uh, and you live in a surveillance state, go for it. But that's not the world I want to live in. I believe in freedom and human rights and personal rights and all those things. And that's the world I think we're trying to defend right now. And the Russia-Ukraine conflict is the first fight in that global struggle in the 21st century. So as you look at military capabilities in, in some of the recent CSIS war games that have, been, uh, that have become public, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the things that actually work relatively effectively are subs, yeah. your Virginia-class subs, your, your strategic bombers, B-21 comes, right. uh, long-range precision uh, weapon, including your long-range anti-ship missiles, your LRASMs. Your sense about what, what capabilities we need for that? Well, I read parts of your report. I, maybe you'll invite me back and take me in detail. But what was uh, surprising but not surprising, right, was uh, some of the conclusions you drew. And to me, it, it seemed like uh, what you said made sense. But look, at the end, uh, in the fall of 2020, we, we released after uh, eight-month study uh, our future vision of the Navy, called it Battle Force 2045, I think. And we built a 500 plus ship Navy, a combination of manned and unmanned ships. We wanted to get into distributed lethality, uh, get away from big ships, uh, build more amphibious capability, a number of things. But the number one thing that we concluded that I pointed out was if we did nothing else, did nothing else, we should be building three submarines a year because submarines were a distinct advantage that we had that we should exploit, that we should continue to develop. And we still haven't done it. And it was interesting that your war game drew the same conclusion, as I recall. Except it's so. unclassified. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, our report was unclassified, That's true. too. Yeah. So. Uh, on, on that, March of this year, I think we'll, we'll likely get an announcement on AUKUS on submarines. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a stew. Maybe it's uh, Virginia class. Maybe it's Australians want to do something else. Uh, shipyards are struggling right now. So what is your sense about if, uh, if Virginia class gets a nod on building, what, what, do we have the industrial base right now, including the naval industrial base uh, that we need, including for something like AUKUS? Well, the industrial base is an issue, and it's not just shipyards, but it's workers, and a few other things built into there. But when we, when we put together Battle Force 2045, I'd spent a couple of sessions with the shipyards, with the ship builders, and I said, tell me what you need, because th this is not a new problem. <laughs> and really, I was surprised. They said, look, we need, uh, we need, I think they said, seven years of dedicated, committed funding. If you can guarantee seven years, we can, we can cover our capital costs and our workforce costs. And I thought that was a, a positive development. And that's why when we talked about Battle Force 2045, it would require a significant uh, increase in the Navy shipbuilding account. But you had to invest in the yards and the people to do that. And so I just I don't understand why we are still where we are. In fact, our ship count is going down, which really concerns me because we do need... We have the best Navy in the world, don't get me wrong, but we need a strong, capable Navy that can continue with that forward presence, can continue to de deter Chinese bad behavior, uh, certainly in the South China Sea, East China Sea, you name it, but also beyond the first island chain and around the world because the Chinese Navy is turning, from a, turning into a blue water Navy. I mean, they did an exercise with their carriers recently. So we've got to be very cognizant of that, and we have to, now's the time to really grow our Navy in terms of both quantity and quality. So I want to turn to a subject that's near and dear to your heart, which is the Army. Uh, and there are a couple of, of things here, but let's just start with... That wasn't a bad pitch for an Army guy to supporting the Navy. Come that's on. right. That's true. That was a good pitch. More ships. Um, more should We need more ships, for sure. Uh, on, on the Army, can you talk a little bit about... Um, uh, and, and, and you can you actually feel your interest as your Secretary of the Army and then obviously Secretary of Defense on uh, dealing with... Uh, force modernization. Can you talk a little bit about your priorities while you were both Secretary of the Army and then uh, Secretary of Defense? And I, I do want to come to a little bit of the current state of the Army. Well, it's, it's no secret that the equipment we're using today in the Army is the equipment that we bought during the Reagan era. It's just been upgraded, right? Abrams tanks, Apache helicopters, Bradley fighting vehicles, uh, Blackhawks, you name it, Patriots, the, all the same systems. And great systems, but not necessarily what we need to fight the future fight. And so when I came into office, we knew we had to modernize our equipment, 
our doctrine, the way we train, everything about the Army. So we, we went about launching the so-called Renaissance, is what I called it, and it, we identified a series of capabilities we needed, the top six long-range precision fires, soldier lethality, network C2, air defense. We, we knew what we needed. Then I had to establish Futures Command and do some other major reorganization within the Army to make sure we could support that, and I think Futures Command has been a success. We reorganized basic training, made it longer, tougher, more relevant. I mean, just a number of things to really get the Army in shape, and I'm really proud uh, uh, of where they are and how they're doing. And, I, you, you know, uh, a lot of the Biden administration has carried on a lot of what we did, which is good. We've got the 50th anniversary of the all-volunteer force coming up yeah. shortly. Your general sense about how that's worked out and, and thoughts on where that should head? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I wrote a long op-ed about this last summer, and uh, the bottom line up front is it's been a stunning success in all ways, shape, or form, but I think it's now suffering, has been for some time now, these large, broader social demogra demographic changes in our country, which are not reversible by DOD. So we know, so when I was Secretary of the Army, 71% of America's youth were unqualified to serve. Now it's 79%. So the trend is in the wrong direction. What is that? Obesity, medical issues, physical fitness issues, academic issues. And, uh, and so you get to the point where a country of 332 million people produces 34 million 17 to 24 year olds. When you do the math and you, you get rid of those 79% and then the remaining 20%, those who are interested in serving, you come up with a number, it's like 350,000 young kids. And so the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Space Force are all competing for a share of those 350,000 young kids who are qualified to serve and interested to serve. And basically they have to scoop up half of that group in order to meet their recruiting numbers. That is not sustainable. Out of a nation of, with 34 million young people, we should have a lot more qualified kids. And again, that's attributable to far bigger social and demographic changes. That we, can't, um, that we can't necessarily address. And so the question is, so what? Well, the so what is, at some point, five, eight, 10, 15 years from now, what happens when you no longer have qualified young people? What do you do? Low, you either lower the standards, which is not a good thing, or you keep the standards high, which means you have to man the force with fewer people. That's a national security concern of mine, and it's something I think needs to be addressed now before we get to the crisis stage. So one element that, um, that you dealt with quite a bit, and I think it would be helpful to unpack it for folks, is the night court. Uh, what do you think is well understood or not well understood about the night court? Is it a sustainable, repeatable model for DOD more broadly? But I think if, if you could start off with what is it, and then more broadly, does it have relevance? Well, night court is not something I named. It came about as a name, and, it'd be, uh, and, and it's just a funny story. But basically, when we were... Um, we were trying to modernize the Army and, and enforce these six priorities and buy whole new weapon systems. I said, okay, well, this is what I want to do. This is going to be my priority. And I said, uh, I, I, when we were preparing our budget in early 2018, John, you've been through this multiple times, you know. They came in and said, sir, here's the budget, how it was last year, and you have like $400 million to do what you want to do. And I said, no, I'm sorry, I have a $60 billion budget. I got $60 billion, and if I want to take from any other pot, I'll do that. I said, go back. And uh, through a series of conversations, I said, go back. I want, I want to see all 500 Army programs in the priority order that you think they should be in. And then we're going to start going through them. And if that, if that program is not more important than a, than a long-range precision fire or a uh, modified fighting vehicle or soldier lethality, then I'm taking off the bottom. And we will keep getting rid of programs until we free up enough money to support those 32 priority programs. And we went through it, so we would, every week, uh, Millie, myself, the whole Army team would sit around, colonels, majors would come in, generals brief, and we'd say, yes, no, cut it, kill it, replace this, not doing that, that's stupid, get away, you know. And uh, by the end of, I think it took us months, 50-some uh, hours, we ended up cutting 186 programs, reducing or eliminating 186 programs and freeing up $38 billion dollars to put into Army priorities. Because I knew that this kind of period when President Trump was putting more money into defense, I knew it wouldn't last, right? It goes in cycles, right? And so I knew the time to fix your roof is, is when it's sunny out, not when it's raining. And what happens though when it's sunny out is everybody, nobody pays attention, they relax. And what I was trying to do is, is energize the system to make the changes now because I knew what would happen down the road. And so we cut 36, 46 billion the first year, another 10 to 15 the next year. 
We put all that money into these new systems. And thank goodness, I mean, we're now at the point where Army Futures Command is saying, of those 32 priorities, 24 will, will, will see the field or be introduced in prototypes this year, this year, after five years, because of all the money and interest and all the other reforms we did, we'll see these programs starting to come through. And uh, we really have a chance now to really uh, drive this renaissance and create the army we need for the 21st century. So I'm, I'm really proud of the team for, for what they did. So changing... But it was ugly. It was, it was ugly, but is, is, it, is it repeatable elsewhere? Oh, look, it's, it's repeatable... It's repeatable if the leadership drives it. You have to have leadership involvement. I mean, I took a lot of personal time to do that. Uh, Bob Gates did the same thing, I think, with MRAPs and other stuff. It takes the personal time of the leader to focus on specific issues if they want to try, drive change in large organizations, particularly large bureaucratic ones like DOD. And so that's, it's repeatable in that sense, if you have that will. And look, I was blessed with a good leadership at the team in the Army. We were all combat vets. Uh, we, were, we, we all saw the, the problems the same way. We all saw the solutions the same way. So that was a blessing to have that team in place then to do that. And it drove, when you have that type of unity and camaraderie between the civilians and the uniforms, there's a lot you can get done. Civil military relations. Yep. I'm going to read the quote. The flip on the, side of the coin. <laughs> the other side of the coin. I'm going to read the quote on the back cover of your book, uh, okay. which is, this is President Trump speaking. Can't you just shoot them? Just shoot them in the legs or something. So can you unpack the context a little bit and just take a step back and talk a little bit about any, the lessons on civil military uh, relations? I mean, you were, at a, you were dealing with a pretty dicey picture at that time. Yeah, so there's my previous comment. There's two sides of the civil military relations coin. One is the relationship between the civilians in DOD and the military in DOD, and I, talk, I have a whole chapter on that. Yes. And then there's the relationship between the military and the civilian population it serves, and with the civilian leadership in, in, in that context. So what you're describing is a scene the morning of June 1st, 2020, after a long weekend of protests in D.C., cars lit a fire, vandalism happening in D.C., Secret Service agents hurt, National Guard hurt uh, due to protests surrounding the, the tragic murder of George Floyd. And the president calls us in and is really upset about what's happening. He, he believes that, uh, that uh, the, the government, the, we look weak, the country looks weak, he looks weak, and he wants tough action to put down these protests. And the conversation goes back and forth. The tr president is very animated. And uh, we, being myself, uh, Attorney General Barr and, and Mark Milley, are pushing back on this notion uh, about the use of active duty forces. And uh, I'm kind of talking about the historical precedent, you know, in my mind, about what that would mean, what it would, the, the damage it would do to the institution, the damage it would do to the country, and trying to explain to the president we should, if we're going to use the military at all, we should use the National Guard, and we should use them in the context of supporting law enforcement, right? Uh, that's how the National Guard best performs its role. And this is a lot of historical examples to do this. But we reach this point in the conversation, and the, the president calms down. He's sitting behind the desk in the Oval, and he leans over, and he looks forward really at Millie. And he, he asks this, he asks a, uh, he makes a suggestion in the form of a question. And he says, can't we just shoot them? Just shoot them in the legs or something. Uh, and, and what he's proposing is that the, the military shoot the protesters to kind of quell the protests. And uh, needless to say, we're all taken aback uh, by this. And, and, you know, I, I, I remember the documentaries of what happened at Kent State and how Americans were killed by the National Guard then and the tragedies of the Vietnam era and all that happened. And, you know, I, I didn't live through that period in terms of being a military, but I came into the military in 1982 into the academy. So I knew all the stories, people who lived through a tough time for a great institution. And we didn't want to go back into that. Look, we serve the American people in the military, right? We don't, we don't shoot them. We serve them. We are the nation's defenders. And uh, to me, it was a, a very low moment to be there in the Oval Office and hear the Commander-in-Chief say that. There were other issues you had to deal with, uh, the promotion issue, including the Vindman issue, which you describe in detail, uh, attempts to influence the promotion right. of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, in, in, in that case, Lieutenant Colonel the photo op issue, Lafayette Park, uh, the deployment of uh, troops to the border with mm -hmm. Mexico, potentially even firing standoff weapons into Mexico itself. Um, how did, as you take a step back, are there two or three lessons that you have taken away about how to deal with a situation like this? Um, you know, that, that, 
that is, uh, I mean, this cuts to the core of civil military issues, particularly from, from White House in, and, and Venezuela. You could add, add, add sure. Venezuela to this. Well, look, they're all different situations, and you have to go back to your oath. Your oath is to the office, and uh, I'm, uh, to the, your oath of office is to the Constitution and what it says. And the dilemma built into that is the fact that uh, the Constitution says we have a commander-in-chief, and the commander-in-chief is responsible for the armed forces, and you're bound to obey the orders of the, of the president as such. So you have to look at each situation. You know, in the case of Lieutenant Colonel Vimman, the president had complete right, prerogative, to have on his NSC staff who he wants to have on his NSC staff. That's, that's true of any president. But it's inappropriate to reach into the military personnel system and to say a person should not be promoted or should be fired, if you will, uh, for doing their job, and, and unless there's some type of derogatory uh, evidence to the same. And I talk about this in my book, how we said, well, sh you know, show me what you have. So uh, that's where you kind of draw those distinctions. Uh, the notion of deploying a quarter million troops to the border to, you know, fend off caravans, not an illegal order, maybe an unwise one, not, not something that Trump suggested, but one of his aides. But there's, so there's these issues where legal, illegal, ethical, unethical, prudent, imprudent, where you've got to sort through this each at a time and, and keep in mind, you know, your oath of office, your duty to the president, your duty to the institution, your obligations to the people who work for you, both uniform and civilian, and you've got to weigh those out. And, you know, look, I had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, good people working for me. Jen, um, uh, Jen, my former chief of staff, is sitting right up here, Jen Stewart. People who, good advice and help us kind of think through these and work through these in the, in the best way for the for all those different players. And any, any advice going forward, not specific to, uh, to incidents, but as someone tries to manage those issues? Look, I think you have to have a very a clear moral compass uh, that, that, and, and understand who you're working for and why you're doing it and who your loyalties are to. And I've said multiple occasions, your, your loyalty, your oath is to the Constitution, not to a president, not to a party, not to a political philosophy, but to the Constitution. And we've built up over 240 some years of this great republic, some guardrails and rules and things by which we live. And I was blessed to understand those going back to my earliest days, my education at West Point. I had a good sense of what that was. But I think when you go into these jobs, you have to have that because there are moments where you will be alone or you'll be put on the spot and you gotta decide quickly in some cases, and certainly deliberately about which way you're gonna go, what you're gonna recommend, uh, what you will do. And that's, that's the tough part. Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of debates while you were uh, Secretary of Defense about what to do with Afghanistan. I know you spent a lot of time talking to my former boss, Scott Miller, who was at the time the, the uh, ISAF commander. Um, there were the discussions about uh, the, uh, the uh, peace negotiations with the Taliban. You fast forward to after you left, uh, we withdrew. The government collapsed. Uh, Taliban now are the government in um, in Afghanistan. Your thoughts on how that whole process went down and, and how you see Afghanistan also moving forward? And the withdrawal. The withdrawal. Yeah, look, I, th I think it was abysmal, right? It was uh, tragic, and we lost uh, 13 brave Americans. Uh, we left Americans behind, by the way. There are still Americans, as I understand, in country who are trying to get out or, and or getting out. And so it really hurt us on the world stage. Some would argue, some people from both sides of the aisle would say that it was a reason by which Putin just decided to invade um, Ukraine because he saw America maybe not committed, fully committed after 20 years of warfare. So I think it was terrible and it's going to be something we have to get beyond and it will take time. And there likely will be hearings in Congress coming out of the House over the next few months about this. So yeah, it was pretty, pretty bad show of things. So based on your time, would you have supported if you had been secretary through that 2020, 2021 period? continuing a small presence there, or is that, is that hard to, to, to answer uh, in hindsight? Well, so I talk about this in my book, right, and Jen will remember this as well. You know, we, the President Trump spoke in the, in the autumn of 2020, October 2020. He wants to get out by Christmas or the end of the year, one of those two periods, which, which was, would be tough to do logistically. But all along, I had said that I would support the peace agreement. It wasn't a great agreement, but I thought it was a good enough agreement. I would support it if it was conditions-based which meant, in this case, the Taliban had to live up to their end of the deal. They had to do certain things, right? Um, and, and they were not doing that. So when this notion came up, the president was talking about withdrawing everybody by Christmas, I quickly pulled in my team, both military and civilian, and I knew, where, I knew what I wanted to do, but I wanted to hear from them. And I said, 
pull your thoughts together, put it in writing, and send it to me. And they sent it up. And everybody agreed that we should not get out, that we should make the Taliban live up to their obligations. And we should pause. We were at 4,500. Pause. And I put that, my thoughts together in a classified memo and send it over to the president, end of October, early November, in response. And that likely contributed to my firing. I don't know. But that was my view, is um, you pause until they live up to the end of the deal. deal. And if you have to, you take the fight back to them. You threaten or you inflict violence upon them until they live up to their end of the deal. So uh, that's kind of was my position in November of 2020, and that would have been my position if I were advising the president in the spring of 2020. But look, at the end of the day, it's the president's call. If he wants to get out, you know, uh, our duty is to offer our best advice and, uh, and try and shape the plan as best we can and, uh, and then execute his orders. And if we don't like it, we have the option of resigning, right? So you talk in the book, and this... The civilians, not the military. That's, that's, that's different, yes. Uh, you talk in the book also about other withdrawal debates, Germany, right. uh, South Korea, Syria. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the uh, back and forth you had with the White House on withdrawal of forces from Germany, the issue that got raised up about South Korea, yeah. Syria, how you dealt with it, and then just more broadly about what you think force posture should look like and the role of the U.S. military overseas because there are, even in the current Congress right now, there are very different views about to what degree we need a U.S. military overseas right. um, uh, with the restraint and the progressive crowd. Well, let me begin with the Germany one because I think it's most relevant to what's happening today. Um, you know, needless to say, the president was not happy with the Germans and Angela Merkel in particular. And so we, we reached a point um, during, during his uh, administration in the summer of 20, where I got the order to withdraw up 10,000 troops from Germany, right? And his, the president's notion, as recommended by his NSC, was to bring them home, right? Uh, put them back in the United States. And look, I had been going through reviews with each of the combatant commands because what I was trying to do is find out um, wh where there was fat or where the mission didn't fit the, the troop need because I wanted to do one of two things, either bring those troops home so I could refit and keep them rested for whatever may happen in the future or find missions for them in the Indo-Pacific. So I'd already begun a review with uh, European Command and had told the President this, but bottom line is we got the order, we had to come up with it in 30 days, and actually he wanted to withdraw these troops from Germany in 90 days. And in my view, called the, the commander in Todd Walters and said, look, here's what I want you to do. I, I laid out some parameters. It couldn't, it couldn't uh, weaken the alliance. It, couldn't, uh, it had to continue to deter Russia. There were four or five things I outlined in my book principles by which I wanted him to drop some options. And he did a remarkable job. He came back and said, this is our plan. And what we ended up doing was consolidating squadrons, uh, returning units to, uh, you know, reuniting units that were divided, uh, moving his headquarters to Brussels so that his headquarters were consolidated. But importantly, and what we did later actually was, rather than move these big units like the strikers uh, out, of, um, out of Germany, what I wanted to do was move them into Romania. And, and I wanted to do the Baltics as well, but there wasn't, we weren't ready for that. But move them east. I didn't want to bring them home. I wanted to move them east because I thought we had to, one of the principles was to continue to deter Russian aggression. And so I thought that was important to do that. And I know because I had talked, spoken to the Romanians and the Bulgarians, by the way, they were willing partners to do that. And so that was my plan. Uh, you, you know, the president was unhappy uh, about the German failure to abandon Nord Stream, and he was unhappy about German failure to meet their GDP obligations. They were like at 1.3%. And by the way, he was absolutely correct on both points, and I fully supported that, and I would talk privately to, privately to the Germans about this, and publicly, by the way. And so, uh, and so I didn't have an issue with restructuring the force within, uh, within Europe, but there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it, and I thought what they were proposing was the wrong way to do it. And I had gone back to him with what I proposed, and look, he accepted it, but it wasn't, the communications plan didn't reflect that. It, it, it came across more as a strategic retreat. And actually, if you would go back now, you'd see what we were trying to do. I think we would have been in a better position if we'd fulfilled that plan of moving and consolidating and doing stuff like that. But it's history now. So how important is uh, U.S. involvement in the world today? Look, nobody else can lead the world uh, but for the United States. We have the economic, uh, diplomatic, and military power to do this. I think a lot of countries look to us for leadership. Uh, I would like to see more player leadership role. 
Um, but we are instrumental. If we don't, then we create vacuums. And when you create vacuums, then bad guys move into those vacuums. So you saw Russia. Uh, you know, China's trying to make moves in Asia because we're not there. I think, uh, you know, in the news recently is the continued vacuum, if you will, in Latin America, where the Chinese have a heavy presence through the Belt and Road Initiative, same as in Africa. So there's a lot we need to do. And look, the military can do its share, but I think, as I argue in a book, we need to bolster our diplomatic corps, our State Department. We can do more on foreign aid, all those things to fill that vacuum. And I know, you know, people don't like to do it, um, particularly folks on, you know, parts of the Republican Party, my party, but, you know, pay now or pay more later. And uh, I, I think it's, it's an investment, if you will, in our own uh, national security, our own economic prosperity, all those things, if we continue to lead the world and, and, and invest in key parts of it as well. Right. Last question, because we are at the, uh, at the end of the uh, discussion right now. And this, this goes back not just to the Army, but there have been definitely some recruitment challenges within some of the military for the reasons you outlined earlier. So what's your elevator pitch for those uh, that are thinking about serving to serve and those that are thinking about getting out to stay? What's your service pitch uh, for the U.S. military? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, my, my, my pitch would be, look, if you're a young person and you're, you want to learn a skill, you want to uh, work as a team, you want to be mission focused, you want to travel to places you wouldn't travel otherwise, experience things, if you want to get money for for college, all those things. Uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines uh, offer that opportunity. And you don't have to stay for a career, just stay for three years. You'll never regret it. The friends you make, the lessons you learn, what you experience in the military will last you throughout a lifetime. And I guarantee you will look fondly back upon those times and re recall them as the best in your life. And uh, that would be my pitch. Well, there's a lot we didn't cover. We didn't get to Iran. I wanted to get to Qasem Soleimani. I wanted to get to the NSC process and NATO and a few other things. Just uh, buy everybody a book. Well, so. that's what I was going to say. For those that, that, uh, that really want those answers, uh, they're in here uh, in various places with, with footnotes, too. So um, if you could all join me in uh, thanking Secretary Esper for, for coming in and really giving uh, some, some full answers to your questions. Thank you for joining thank you. us.